I will try. And uh, it's actually a very exciting topic, of course, uh, because although the title is a little bit long-winded and frankly a bit dull in some ways, I like the subtitle. So focus on the subtitle, which is uh, The Future and How to Get There. Fairly ambitious title. Um, but I thought, you know, it's early on a Monday morning, a Tuesday morning in Amsterdam, and as Aaron mentioned, there's a lot to keep you entertained here. So uh, we should reach far and wide to explore the future. And I'm going to take you on a whirlwind tour to the future and back and try and convince you of the following. We have in hand a set of technologies and architectures that will actually revolutionize how we interact with each other and with content, media, and services delivered from the cloud. Those technologies are within our grasp. The architectures are within our grasp. What we have to decide is whether we have the confidence and ambition to build these networks and whether the economics can sustain that build. That's all we have to decide here. So it's a unique moment in time. It's not often where we have had the clarity that we know how to do it and we have the technologies in hand to do it and it's really a question of choice and then the economic reality that supports that. But we're going to go on that journey. I'm going to convince you, hopefully, that we do have those things in hand and we have a sustainable model about connecting the hand to the cloud and the role of ultra-broadband in doing that so that we actually have this future reality right in front of us. So, one thing I would sort of uh, connect to Aaron's uh, introduction. Think about this in Amsterdam terms. In the 17th century in Amsterdam, the city fathers decided that in order to enable global commerce, they needed to connect the merchant homes via canals to the port and the ocean beyond. You needed that complete network, which is a transportation and commerce network. What I'm going to argue today is, in fact, we're doing a similar thing with ultra-broadband. But we're connecting the hand and machines, people and machines, because we're mobile. So it's not about just houses. It's about devices and, and people. We're using ultra-broadband and a virtualized SDN-defined network that connects the ultra-broadband to the cloud. So instead of house to ocean, it's actually hand and device and machine to the cloud. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So when you think about it, it's easy to say what I've just said, but in fact, it's a very demanding thing we're trying to do. And I've sort of parsed it into sort of five big categories of thing we have to do. And each of them have at least one order of magnitude scaling. That means at least a tenfold, and in many cases, a hundredfold change we need to make. So that's really challenging. So let's parse those a little bit. What are they? Well, number one, you could consider sort of the device factor. The device factor says we're going to have to onboard maybe 10x the number of devices today, and many of those are going to be very low cost, low power, and low revenue devices on the machine end of the spectrum. So we've got a 10x problem in devices, maybe even a challenging revenue model in devices, but a combination of challenging revenue but more of those devices perhaps provides enough economic stimulus to build this network. But we're going to question that. So there's a device problem. Those devices create demand. Those devices, in many cases, are devices like this one. This device, I'm going to say, profoundly changes the way we behave and the capacity we need in networks. So we've got a hundredfold capacity problem ahead of us. Maybe a hundredfold in signaling capacity for machines, but a hundredfold bearer capacity to satisfy tablets. So that's a big problem. And we're going to solve that problem with a new architecture around small nodes and small cells. We'll talk about that. The other thing we have is a problem of scale. Number three, think of as a scale problem. We have national networks and multiple of those that are disparate and don't interconnect very well. And then, of course, internationally, the problem is just compounded and so on and so forth. 400 operators with 400 networks, and they don't have global scale. So when we're thinking about web services, cloud services, the context of national doesn't make as much sense anymore. We need to go international. So we've got a scale problem we have to solve. Number four, 
is an elasticity problem because I've got varying demand patterns. If I go global and if I'm attaching to web services rather than well-defined wall garden services that have been defined for 100 years, I've got an elasticity problem I need to scale up and down dynamically. I have to solve that problem. And then number five, I have a simplicity problem. I could consider it a simplicity or a velocity problem in some ways. I need to innovate faster. I used to, as a telco vendor or telco provider, I've developed one service per decade, and I would argue, if we're honest, probably one service in 100 years, right, which is voice. That is the sustainable revenue service. And on top of that, I added a data service about a decade or two ago. So maybe I've done two services in 100 years. If I think about the web world, I'm onboarding new services daily. So I have to balance those two. I have to connect those two. And that's my velocity problem as well as my simplicity problem in order to be able to do it. So think of it. We're going to talk about a device problem, a demand problem, a uh, elasticity problem, a scalability problem, and a simplicity problem. So let's get going. So you could say that this is all future talk, but I want to show you in the next slide here that in fact we're already on the way. This is a favorite slide of mine that looks at the evolution of computing. And what I'll show you is mobile computing in particular is now the dominant form of computing. So in this study or analysis of data since the advent of let's say, personal computing, you see that the red line is the growth of tablets. The blue line is laptops, and the green line is desktops. And what has happened is that tablets have risen from nowhere a couple of years ago to be the dominant form of personal computing. And look at that growth rate. It's unprecedented uh, in the history of personal computing. Now, that's interesting, but why is it important to us? Well, I'm going to come back to this. There are no wires on this device. I have no Ethernet port. It's a wireless device. If the dominant computing device is now this, and it's only a wireless device, I have to build wireless networks with capacity, not just coverage, that satisfy the demands of this device. Point one. Secondly, this device is very, because it's a mobile device, has limited storage and computing power because it has to fit in a certain form factor and have a certain battery life. So this device has to connect to the cloud constantly in order to complete the service paradigm because it simply can't store and process everything it needs here. It needs to connect to the cloud. So I need a high capacity network to connect to the cloud. And it has to be ubiquitous. Back to the title of my talk, this thing has to connect to the cloud ubiquitously. And to underscore that ubiquity point, it's also a device that you use at home, as well as at work, as well as everywhere in between. So it sort of converges lives, enterprise work on the go. So I need that ubiquitous network to be always on. So this device profoundly changes how we behave. So let's look at some other data. If you look here, I've replicated that tablet data here in the, the top line. But what I show is there are other trends that we can, always point, we can already point to that say things are moving together in a way that is a portent of how things are going to be and, in fact, confirms the thesis I'm going to put in front of you. So if you look, we're going to have, see a rise of wearables. That's the machine point that's coming. You see the machine-to-machine -machine connections are predicted to rise with a very similar sort of exponential growth. But to make that happen, I need to deploy a small cell architecture which is what I've indicated by Wi-Fi access points here as a proxy for the combined cellular Wi-Fi units that are beginning to appear. And I need to use the cloud and use SDN and virtualization to enable that reality. So if you look at how things are ramping across all the domains I've mentioned, you're beginning to see us not just speculate about these things, not just hypothesize that these things could exist, but they're beginning to be real. So let's go through. That's point one. We're going to start talking about the ultra-broadband piece of that, and then we'll get into the cloud piece and see if you come with me on this journey. So I thought I'd start with wireline. I've talked a lot about wireless with the tablet being a wireless device, but in fact, wireline is the answer to wireless. The future of wireless is small and wired, and that's a wireline network that is going to 
be the backbone of that connectivity. So what I've looked at here to start with, and then we'll get over to wireless, is what's the future of wireline? Do we have the technologies in hand? What I've plotted here is distance versus bandwidth. And I've plotted in colors the lowest cost technology to solve that particular combination of bandwidth and distance. And you can see I've got a no distance at the bottom, and you can look at that offline. But broadly, what I show with the color chart is we have invented and we have in hand the complete array of technologies to solve the problem from one megabit per second to 1,000 megabits per second or a gigabit per second with a continuous array of technologies, starting from the old days of CO-based ADSL and moving through fiber to the node with VDSL and vectoring, and now in future to G.fast and GPON. So that's interesting. We've got the technologies in hand. What's even more interesting is that the economics of these technologies are about 100 times lower cost per bit as I go from the top left to the bottom. The key is, do we need those bits? Of course, it's not worth paying for a technology if you don't need the bits, but if you need the bits, we have the technologies in hand to offer 100 times lower cost per bit with wireline access. So it's phenomenally important. So let's look at wireless for a bit. Some of you here will be wireless experts, but for those of you who aren't, I'm going to give you my one-minute tutorial on the future of wireless. Broadly, there's only three things you can do in wireless, and they'll be very familiar to anyone who's thought about networks. If I have a resource, which is spectrum, that attenuates with distance, I have a highly con constrained problem. What I could do is try and solve it by just getting more spectrum. But that's a finite resource that there isn't infinite availability. So the blue part is my macro approach is really just to split some macro cells and buy more spectrum, but I'm only going to get a factor of two there. The purple part is physics. I could be better at my uh, signal-to-noise ratio. Uh, I can improve that by either removing interference, essentially the same approach as vectoring, or superimposing signals using coherent techniques like comp, so that I add the signals together to get a better signal-to-noise ratio that way. But since we're close to the Shannon limit of transmission over wireless uh, medium, over uh, RF medium over air, we're only going to get a factor of two from physics if I do everything in purple. So I'm left with the green. And the green is very simple. It's the same logic as fiber to the node or HFC node splitting. If I've got limited resource that attenuates with distance, I go closer. And that's what small cells are all about. And you can show that, in fact, you can increase the capacity of a wireless network in proportion to the number of small cells you deploy. So if I deploy 10, I get a gain of 10 per macro. If I deploy 100, I could get a gain of 100. And if you can manage the interference between cells, which you can, you have the possibility of scaling wireless networks by a factor of 10 or even 100. The question, so in summary here of the wireless network uh, reality is the only answer, if we want to build capacity networks that connect tablets to the cloud, is I can no longer go along that left-hand axis of my triangle of truth. I like to call this my triangle of truth about wireless. In other words, I can't play the spectrum and spectral efficiency game anymore. That was good for coverage networks. If I want to build capacity networks to connect tablets to the cloud, I have to move in the other dimension, which is decrease the spatial area and reuse my assets over and over again. Now, what we did is look at, is this affordable? Because remember, I framed this problem by saying, we have the technologies in hand. We have the architectures in hand. I've told you now. We know the architecture is a small cell architecture backhauled by a wireline network. It's going to connect to the cloud, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But can we afford to do this? Well, yes. What we did was build a model that said, let's assume we need to sustain today's profitability for telecom operators. And that's what the, the contour is here. Maintain today's profitability, but offer more. How do I do it? Well, if you look at the efficiency, in other words, the price performance advantage of LTE and LTE plus small cells, you see that you can actually go from today's world and offer 10x the capacity by deploying that network because of the superior price performance metrics. In addition, if I can be clever about loading content off-peak, which is what smart loading is about, so I 
use my unused network capacity, let's say during the middle of the day, I've got the morning peak, I've got the evening peak, but if I can use the lulls, the overnight uh, lull and the, and the middle of the day lull, I can actually get an efficiency by smart loading that could actually be significantly larger than I even show here. If you can retrain people about accepting content or predicting when you can deliver content to them. And then if I have new business models and new revenue, I can even improve the problem further. So it's possible that wireless networks can also expand at, at, a, at an economic paradigm that works by factors of 10, 20, or more. But I want to start talking about the cloud. The reality is today's network operators are dictated by their connectivity value proposition on the left. You see, their fundamental value proposition is the capacity and connectivity they offer subscribers. But they have various problems, which is that velocity of service onboarding, the number of services they can support, and a revenue model that is stagnant. On the other side are the former OTTs, who I will argue are no longer OTTs, but actually also their web-scale service providers who are also building networks. But their core asset isn't necessarily the network, it's large data centers of compute and storage, which they then build networks to interconnect, and increasingly, as you're going to hear from Google Fiber, they're moving into the access domain. Now, why is that? It's because ultra-broadband is the critical on-ramp to that cloud network reality, and without ultra-broadband, you stall this whole generative model or virtuous cycle of connecting the hand to the cloud. Interesting thing here, though, is that not just are we moving into the access domain from the web scale side, but technologies are moving between the two. So IP technologies are moving from telco into the data center, IP MPLS in particular. On the other hand, IT technologies, virtualization and SDN, are moving from the data center into the telco, both in the telco data center and in the WAN. And those two trends are now converging how we approach networking. And it could give rise to, and should give rise to, a brand new paradigm of networking where seamlessly data centers connect with each other and connect with the WAN. And I'm going to show you my picture of how I see this going. On the left is the old world model I've discussed. IT data centers connected over internet or IP peering point to telco grade facilities that were bespoke running over multiple different access networks that were largely disconnected, some combination of consumer enterprise legacy and IP access networks. When we think about network 2.0, what I'll call maybe the I network, and I'll explain that later, is here we have a paradigm where for the first time, we actually start connecting the web data centers with the telco data centers, and they use the same technology of virtualization and SDN Moreover, I then move those data centers deeper into the network to increase, decrease the latency, increase the performance, and use SDN and virtualization to connect those data centers. And better still, I can use those techniques to connect the networks to each other, to solve that scalability problem, where now national networks can become global networks and tie to web services and onboard a process in an IT-grade data center and seamlessly connect it within the data center through the WAN over the ultra-broadband access network. So this is a brand new reality that converges all the things I show on the slide, with ultra-broadband being the critical on-ramp to enable that. So I want to talk just a little bit about virtualization, and then uh, I'll bring it all together. One of the things to realize, why are we virtualizing networks? Well, this is the simple answer. If you look at this old law called Amdahl's law, it basically said, how do I speed up an application? And the old way of thinking was, I rewrite the application to be parallelized, and then I can run bits of the application on separate processes. The problem with that, it was, it was hard to rewrite applications, to parallelize them. So what we did instead with virtualization in FE is recognize that, in fact, the answer is to take the application and virtualize the whole thing. And you can only do that if you have ultra-low-cost compute, which we now have. So in the Amdahl's law, think of what we're essentially doing is paralyzing the whole application, which gives us infinite scaling at non-infinite cost. In fact, at affordable cost that drives the economic model. So when we think about what we can now virtualize based on that, look at this chart. 
This is analysis we did that looked at the economics and the gain of virtualization. Everything in green is virtualizable. These are the control plane applications of the network. Everything that's an application or session control application is virtualizable with both cost and performance gain. The only thing you don't virtualize are the blue pieces. And the blue pieces are high performance packet processing applications because generally network processors do better at that than an Intel or a MIPS processor. For example, typical uh, CPU core is about 10 gigabits per second of packet processing. Here we're talking in typical state-of-the-art high, high order packet processing, 400 gigabit per second. So it's sort of a factor of 40 or more difference between those two. The other, interestingly, is anything with a DSP in it. So physical layer termination devices like access nodes and like optical with coherent technology, those typically have specialized processors based on DSPs. So those pieces stay common with today's architecture, but massively scale within that architecture. And everything else massively scales using the cloud. That's the future paradigm. So if I now bring this all together, I'm going to bring it home and hopefully show you how these things connect. We have a world where we're going to software define that IP layer, which has an ultra broadband on ramp. The services control function and the network applications that run on top of that, like IMS, are going to be virtualized. And they're going to get virtualized in order to lead to that dynamic scaling function that allows me to massively resell and repurpose my network. And that's what I show here. The goal, and maybe you can see the little dotted lines, is if I can repartition my network dynamically and elastically scale the control plane and connect it together with SDN, I can take applications that are either web applications, enterprise applications, or my own applications, NFE, and actually provide them, slice them, so they actually share the same network infrastructure, but in a way that generates new value and new revenue. So that's the slice and monetize paradigm. One network infrastructure, federated together, virtualized uh, in large part, seamlessly connecting enterprise web scale and telco worlds and going from national to global. And then my last point is I have to, of course, seamlessly onboard these applications and manage this network, and that's going to be one of the remaining challenges is to unify the OSS systems and create a new cloud OS that combines the best of IT with the best of legacy network management and OS systems. So I like to call this the singular software-defined software network. The software network refers to NFE. The software defined is connecting those virtualized instances. And this is the future that we realize. So back to where I started, I hope to have convinced you in the time we've been on this whirlwind tour, but ultra broadband provides the on-ramp to a virtualized and SDN connected world that should transform how we behave as humans and how we and our machines connect to us anywhere, anytime. I like to call it the I-network of integrated, intelligent, intuitive, international, all IP, uh, IT-enabled network infrastructure. With that, I'll thank you, and if there's time for questions, I'll take a question or two. Thanks, Eric.